And with that, this session of the Senate impeachment trial takes uh, what you heard will be a short break. We've spent the last two hours or so listening to the president's defense team make the case that the House managers have been wrong, that they've left out crucial evidence that would uh, show that, that President Trump did have good reasons for withholding aid from Ukraine. Uh, they have gone down a list of statements made by witnesses who appeared before the House. Uh, it has been, um, uh, it, there's been some repetition of what we heard on Saturday, but uh, it's clearly the building of a case uh, that the president uh, should not be impeached, which uh, the, the defense has argued from the beginning. I do want to bring in our guests here at the table. They are Paul Rosenzweig. He was senior counsel for Ken Starr, who we heard a moment ago during the Whitewater investigation into President Clinton. David Rivkin worked in the Justice Department and the White House Counsel's Office in the Reagan and George H.W. Bush administrations. Victoria Norris was special counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee in the early 1990s. She also served as an appellate lawyer in the Justice Department under President George H.W. Bush and as Vice President Joe Biden's chief counsel from 2015 to 2016. And finally, John Hart worked for Congressman Tom Coburn, Republican of Oklahoma, during the Clinton impeachment trial and later for Senator Coburn. Hello to all of you. We welcome you to the table. Um, I want to come uh, right away, David Rivkin, to the argument we heard from Ken Starr, who was, of course, the special counsel investigating President Clinton uh, and an investigation that led to an impeachment by the House. And then the Senate, of course, did not remove President Clinton from office. But how strong was the case that he made that uh, what the House did was flawed and that essentially the Senate should be very careful, very reluctant to remove a president from office, especially during an election year. I think, Judy, you made a very compelling case. You made a compelling case that the House has flouted numerous constitutionally required procedures in failing to secure a well-reasoned, uh, well justified impeachment in a bipartisan fashion. He also touched upon something I would expect Professor Dershowitz to speak about later, and the point is dear and near to me, that even if you assume the worst interpretation of those facts, that there was explicit linkage between the dispensation of aid or the pausing of aid and a certain in, in corruption investigations, even that would not be a high crime and misdemeanor because it would not violate any legal duty. In addition to that, he also talked about, again, a solemn responsibility, particularly on the Senate, as a cooling saucer to restore the integrity of a constitution, why it should transcend any political considerations. Paul Rosenzweig, um, we were discussing while Ken Starr was speaking at the same time, when he makes the case that it's one thing for judges to be impeached, they're given a life uh, term, they're appointed for life. A president, on the other hand, is elected for four years, perhaps re-elected. Uh, it's something that should happen far less frequently to presidents. One can't help but think back to the Clinton impeachment. We didn't hear that argument from him then. Well, we certainly didn't hear it from him then, and uh, and the reason is pretty clear, which is that Judge Starr started off rightly, I think, with the text of the Constitution and the phrases that it uses, treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. There's no clause in the impeachment provisions of the Constitution that says, and a different standard applies to judges than to uh, presidents. He may very well be making a prudential argument that in his personal opinion, it would be better to defer to the body politic than, uh, than to act with an impeachment right now. But as a matter of text and as a matter of constitutional history, uh, that's just wrong. Uh, to cite the simplest example, Andrew Johnson was impeached in his first term in office. Uh, and so, you know, the argument that you have to only have impeachments in a second term of office is kind of a historical at a minimum. Joining us now from uh, just outside the Senate chamber, Senator Mark Warner, Democrat of Virginia. Senator Warner, you've heard the beginning of this second day of arguments from the president's defense. What do you make of it overall so far? Well, um, three quick uh, impressions. One, you know, I have a lot of respect for Ken Starr. I've known him and his wife for a long time. Uh, I thought it was curious that they raised the point as your guest was raising that um, uh, somehow raising this issue in an election year may be inappropriate. Well, the truth is, this at least the allegations are all about the president 
uh, withholding the aid, withholding the White House meeting because the president wanted to use this to try to influence the 2020 election. So uh, if the transgression was involving the election, the idea that we should postpone somehow doesn't doesn't carry a lot of water with me. Number one. Number two, um, I still wonder, and this is why I'll get to my point in a moment, that there's a dozen either senior Trump appointees or career uh, federal officials who put their careers on the line coming forward, uh, either being concerned about the call or then absolutely having the impression, or at least in Mr. Sondland, hearing directly uh, that there was this withholding of the aid um, due to the desire to have these political investigations. And third, I thought it was just as a point of reference, it was curious that um, I don't think the, ha the president's lawyers um, mentioned the name Rudy Giuliani at all. I don't know if we're going to get through the whole presentation uh, without Mr. Giuliani's name being mentioned. Obviously a name that came up a lot from the House managers and a lot in the president's own transcript and the president's own comments. Um, end of the day, though, I think probably the, the news that uh, we're all trying to process, and I know talking to my Republican colleagues, is, you know, what are they going to do with this notion that a guy that was in the room, um, to use the Hamiltonian comparison, you know, John Bolton, uh, who's clearly been willing to testify, who could speak directly to what happened and as well as causation, uh, I don't know how in any kind of sense of fair trial that you wouldn't give him a chance to come forward. I think actually there was a brief mention of Rudy Giuliani uh, in connection with what he said to Ambassador uh, Volcker and what was said to Ambassador Sondland. But to your point about John Bolton, you are right. That is uh, receiving a great deal of attention uh, since the, uh, the excerpt from his book uh, was reported on last night. Uh, we're now hearing from some sources that as many as uh, I think Ambassador Angus King, independent of Maine, is saying that as many, he thinks as many as five or ten Republican senators may now be prepared to uh, vote for, to hear from witnesses. What are you hearing about that, Senator? Well, I've got a lot of friends on the Republican side, and we're having private conversations. Again, it's, it's, it's awful hard when there was a senior person, the National Security Advisor, somebody with John Bolton, who frankly on policy issues, I don't agree with him on virtually anything, but no one could question John Bolton's commitment to conservative principles, to the classic Republican Party, um, to the idea that he would have a book out. Now I understand the book is going to come out in March, and suddenly this book would, would have relevant information that we wouldn't get this. We, the whole Senate would look like a farce. The whole process would look like a farce if we didn't bring him forward. So I think it's going to be tough for my colleagues to uh, uh, turn that down. But again, we've got a few more chapters to, to go through first. Well, I'm sure you're aware, Senator, the, the president himself said what uh, what's being reported is false, uh, that whatever, uh, if John Bolton indeed wrote this, he said it was false. And then you have the White House also saying this looks like something done to sell books. Well, I, I, again, there's one thing that is um, I will give this White House credit for. Uh, they have um, no compunction about attacking anyone, Democrat, Republican, conservative or liberal, whoever voices any concern with uh, the actions of the president. And again, doesn't matter where you fall on the political spectrum, how much service you've had to our country. You are fair game for this White House if you cross President Trump. But so I'm not surprised at that. But I think there's an awful lot of my Republican colleagues Frankly, we've worked with John Bolton for decades, um, as I, and I made, made mention at the outset. I don't agree with John Bolton on a whole lot of policy issues, but I do think that he would come forward and testify truthfully to what he heard and what he believed. And, you know, there are others. Let's face it, if the, the president's chief of staff could still come forward, I, I imagine he would... Um, I don't know what kind of a, a opinion he would give, but if he would come in here and swear to tell the truth, I'd, I'd love to hear from him as well. He actually, I believe, put out a statement this morning, uh, uh, Mick Mulvaney, the president's acting chief of staff, saying that uh, Mr. Bolton never came to him with, with, any such, uh, with any such concern. Senator, quickly, I want to come back to the l last part of the argument the White House 
uh, attorneys were making, uh, which essentially was that the president did, was concerned about corruption, that that emerged from the testimony of several witnesses uh, during the House proceedings. He was not only concerned about corruption, he was also concerned about lack of burden sharing, in other words, lack of support from European countries for Ukraine and a reluctance for the U.S. to bear all or most of the burden. Um, is, does that give you pause when you think about what motivation the president had? Well, I think it's probably accurate, uh, probably in many ways due to John Bolton and others, traditional conservative presence in the White House, that the level of military assistance went up to Ukraine over the three years uh, that President Trump's been in office. But the idea that suddenly he was so concerned about corruption only now after the fact that Mr. Biden got in the race, the fact that he's suddenly concerned about burden sharing, which he's been vis-a-vis -vis NATO's overall um, uh, payment schedule, but the fact that he had those concerns if he had them, and then he then released the aid only after this whole scheme was exposed, where there was no increase in burden sharing, where there was no further indication uh, that you know, there had been dramatic changes in Ukraine's efforts towards corruption. And it appears, based upon you know, the president's own comments in the phone call, that the kind of corruption he was interested in was very much focused both on the Bidens and this completely debunked theory that, Judy, I don't think there's a single member of the Senate Republican side who's on the Intelligence Committee that would lend any credence around the so-called crowd strike or the whole notion that it was Ukraine, not Russia, that intervened in our elections in 2016. Senator Mark Warner, who is the co-chair or vice chair, I should say, of the uh, Senate Intelligence Committee. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you, Judy. Uh, and we, as we're hearing uh, from, um, from Senator Warner, there is a great deal of discussion right now about whether uh, senators will vote because the Republicans are clearly in the majority. At least four of them would have to vote with the Democrats for there to be an agreement to call uh, witnesses before the Senate, to, uh, to, to turn over uh, documents. In a moment, we're going to be speaking with a Republican, uh, Senator Mar Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee. And I, I do want to ask her about that. But I think it's, um, it's striking to uh, recall the sequence of today's arguments that instead of going to the specifics of the facts, which is what uh, the, the, uh, the president's team was principally focusing on on Saturday and then the latter part, uh, this afternoon, we heard from Ken Starr, making the former special counsel during Whitewater and during President Clinton's impeachment, making the case uh, on constitutional grounds that uh, it is the wrong time, the wrong place, the wrong circumstance to impeach uh, this president. Joining us now is the Republican senator from the state of Tennessee. She's Marsha Blackburn. Senator, thank you very much. Good to be with you. Thank you. For talking with us. I want to I wanna pose for you a comment we just heard from Senator Mark Warner of Virginia, uh, going to this point made by the defense attorney for the president just now, that the president was concerned about corruption. He was concerned about burden sharing support from the Europeans. Senator Warner pointed out, pointed out, well, that may have been the case, but then why was the aid released suddenly in September when Ukraine had not made any change in its efforts to address corruption and, and there'd been no change in, uh, in support from the European countries to assist Ukraine? So yes. I'll start with that. Yes, and thank you for that. You know, I think anyone who listened to Donald Trump as he ran for office heard him talk repeatedly about the lack of burden sharing that existed by some of the other countries that should have been participating and supporting. NATO is a prime example where he has continued to talk about this issue and the need for others to help with this so that it didn't land, the burden didn't land fully on the U.S. taxpayer. So corruption, uh, everyone was involved or concerned about corruption and the involvement of that corruption in Ukraine. There was a clip just played for us of Dr. Hill making the point that everyone was uh, concerned about corruption there in the Ukraine. So this is something that is an issue that had been brought forward. It was something important to the president. He talked about burden sharing. 
He talked about rooting out corruption, and as he looked at Ukraine, that was one of the, the uh, concerns that he had about aid that was going there. I think it's important to note also that when you had President Obama withhold aid and then send the blankets and the MREs, and from President Trump, you had that much needed lethal aid that was that was mm. given. That's a very important difference. Senator, just just to circle back quickly, though, to, to Senator Warner's point that if the president was concerned about corruption, was concerned about burden sharing, there was no change in either one of those circumstances when he decided in September to release the aid. So what what did he base the decision to suddenly release the, the aid on? He had been through a process of review, and as we have heard from different ones that have testified, and then as you look at the House Republicans' summary from the House actions, of course, that is not something that the Democrat House managers have brought forward, but when you read the summary from the Republican managers, you can see there are so many interviews that were given, there was no one that said he had conditioned that aid or that an aid, um, a condition of investigations was going to precede any release of aid. Senator, um, the news uh, overnight uh, from uh, about the book written uh, by John Bolton, the president's national security advisor, that President Trump told him in a meeting that he was holding up the aid until there were investigations into the Bidens. Um, where do you think that, first of all, what's your reaction to that? And then second of all, uh, do you believe there now will be some of your Republican colleagues who vote to hear from witnesses, including Mr. Bolton? You know, Judy, I think we're going to have some kind of new revelation every single day yes. as we go through that, yes. through this uh, process. You certainly saw that with the Kavanaugh hearings. And during the Mueller uh, report, the time, the two years of that, there was revelation after revelation. Uh, again, you have reporting that is on hearsay. I think it was about uh, paragraph 31 in the article where they mention that, um, make that reference. And you're going to continue to have hearsay, and uh, we're going to continue to focus on providing impartial justice and delivering a fair trial. In this instance, uh, though, it's Mr. Bolton saying the president said it to him directly. Judy, it is a New York Times article, and it is based <laughs> on hearsay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you're saying you don't accept it, whether it's in the book or not, and we'll find out whether it's we'll in there. We'll find out. We'll find, we'll find out. out. What about uh, the, the question of whether some of your Republican colleagues, at least four or more, will vote for witnesses? What are you hearing about that? The House had the opportunity, and they still have the opportunity to, uh, to call witnesses. What you have to realize, if the Senate moved forward and called witnesses that were not a part of what was happening in the House, uh, the process they went through with impeachment, that would be a change in precedent. And I do not think the Senate is going to vote to call witnesses and to do the House's work for them. We are not here to provide the House a do-over. So you're saying you think the story will be complete as far as the Senate is concerned, even if there are individuals who could be called to testify, who could answer I, some outstanding if questions? The House, if the House wants to open another investigation and call witnesses, they are fully within their right to do that. Another investigation? You mean another impeachment investigation? If the House would like to call witnesses and have an investigation, they can do that. Senator Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee, thank you so much. Good to be with you. Thank you. We appreciate it. So let's come back to, uh, to our, our guests at the table. What we're hearing, um, uh, Paul Rosenzweig, is that uh, you just heard from Senator Blackburn saying she doesn't think the Republicans are going to support witnesses. Um, we are hearing from Senator Angus King, independent of Maine, that he's, it's his sense that you may have enough votes. How much difference is it going to make whether the Senate votes for witnesses or not? Well, it'll make a huge difference in the annals of history. It may make some difference in the election. I'm guessing it won't change the ultimate result of this impeachment trial. But 
I think it would set a dangerous precedent, precedent not to call witnesses. We've never had an impeachment trial in the Senate without some witnesses of one form or another. Uh, to say otherwise is a historical. Uh, John Hart, how much pressure does it put on, on some of these Republican senators uh, in terms of whether to call witnesses or not, now seeing this, uh, this New York Times report about John Bolton's book? I think we're overstating the pressure they feel right now, Judy. I think there are two questions on the table. One question is, would senators like to hear from John Bolton? And Angus King may be right. There may be five or ten who are interested in that. But the real question is, is it worth delaying the trial to hear from John Bolton? And I'm not convinced there are more than two senators who would be willing to go to that point. I think the vast majority of Republicans view this whole proceeding as a crime of political passion. Mm. That this was driven by the House impeach impeachment managers on a, on a partisan crusade. And it was striking, it was stunning. I thought that Ken Starr, he didn't effectively apologize for the Clinton impeachment, but he did say that the Clinton impeachment didn't meet a key test. He just, he just spelled out three tests. The second one was impeachment has to be bipartisan. Right. And he, he's not in a position to apologize for it. He wasn't the instigator. People could argue that. But uh, I thought that was stunning that Ken Starr said an impeachment has to be bipartisan. He was a part of the Clinton impeachment. And Republicans have suffered enormous consequences. The opportunity cost of war, as, as analogy he used, is very high. Who were the two senators you think are read, ready to vote for witnesses? You said you think two. Two. I think Mitt Romney and Susan Collins have all, have all but said they would vote to hear John Bolton, even if it delays the Senate trial, assuming, again, that the president's team uh, blocks, attempts to block it, and it has to be adjudicated. But so. not others at this point. At this point, not at others. Point. Let's go to Lisa Desjardins. At